It was the 1920s during the high point of the Coney Island Carnival when a man named Joel Rolino joined and billed himself as the strongest man in the world after lifting 3,200 pounds. Not only that, but Rolino boasted of lifting 635 pounds with just one finger. He once lifted 450 pounds with his teeth. During an interview in 2008, Rolino, who was at that point 103 years old, he was still enjoying perfect health, and he explained to his interviewer that he was simply born strong. According to his friends, Rolino had always been the model of perfect health. He was a vegetarian for life. He didn't drink or smoke. He exercised every day. Not only that, but he was a lifetime boxer and was even a member of the old-time barbell and strongmen organization, which is made up of elderly men who can still rip book binders at the seam. One friend even believed that Rolino would live to be 120 years old. Unfortunately, Rolino's life came to a tragic end on January 11, 2010, after he was hit by a woman. Well, she was driving a minivan, but... As a result, Rolino died at the hospital several hours later at the age of 104, which only goes to show that even the strongest man in the world will eventually meet his maker. Listen, at that point in time, all of the physical strength in the world can't help anyone to stand before the creator of heaven and earth. That's right. It's going to take heavenly strength, the heavenly strength of God's grace, to enable us to stand before the throne of the Almighty. Well, here in our study today, we're continuing to explore and expound the book of 2 Timothy. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul was helping Timothy to understand how God has given every Christian the heavenly strength that we need to accomplish his calling. Here in our text today, we'll see that the source of this heavenly strength that's found in the grace of God. And so with that, let's jump right into our text. I want to begin reading there at 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, where Paul declared, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Well, here in these verses we find Paul. He's helping Timothy to understand the sort of leadership that he was called to exemplify. You see, as the pastor of the church there in Ephesus, it was Timothy's task to disciple the Christians under his care so that they might mature in the faith and become the true disciples that God desires every Christian to become. And knowing that this is a calling which was beyond Timothy's natural ability, Paul pointed Timothy to the source of heavenly strength there in verse 1, and he did so by writing this. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as we consider Paul's encouragement here, I believe that it would, be, it would benefit every believer here to spend some time exploring the source of heavenly strength that Paul was pointing Timothy to. And so I want to first begin by considering what Paul meant when he told Timothy to be strong. Because here in the context of our exercise crazed culture it would be easy to read this and think that well paul's telling timothy here to join a gym paul's telling timothy here get a personal trainer and go work out go hit the the barbells go go hit the exercise equipment and get strong with this in mind i can't help but to imagine you know paul roaming around passing out little yellow bracelets with the slogan stamped on it be strong Then after winning a bunch of money at the Tour de Greece, he opened up a string of gyms throughout the Gentile world, and now he's simply drumming up business by encouraging Timothy to be strong and and go convince all the other Christians there in Ephesus to take their Sundays and go compete in marathons and triathlons and the like. Oh, no, I'm confusing Paul with somebody else. Sorry. No, Paul wasn't promoting his personal program with this catchy slogan, be strong. 
He wasn't passing out wristbands and, and, and using this as just like a, a, a pithy little saying. No, no, he, he was actually telling Timothy to be strong in a spiritual sense. And in order to better understand this encouragement, I, I want to point out that there are several reasons that lead me to believe that Paul wasn't referring to Timothy's physical strength at all, but instead to the heavenly and, and the spiritual strength that every Christian needs in order to walk in the perfect will of God. One reason why I believe this, one reason why I believe that Paul was pointing Timothy to this heavenly strength, and it's because in his first letter to Pastor Timothy, he reminded Timothy that bodily exercise profits little. Bodily exercise profits little, meaning that there is some profit to bodily exercise. But with that, he was encouraging Timothy that it's more important to spend even more time exercising himself towards godliness. And so, while Paul wasn't opposed to physical exercise... He was clearly encouraging Timothy in that first letter to spend more time developing his spiritual muscles. Another reason why it's clear to me that Paul was referring to a heavenly strength is due to the fact that the phrase, be strong, found here in our text today, it's been translated from the Greek verb, endynamu. That's a word that means to be endowed with power or to receive strength. And since that verb is actually found in a passive tense, Paul was helping us to understand that Timothy wasn't the one producing the strength within himself. It wasn't that he was supposed to go get strong by working out, but no, he was supposed to become strong passively by receiving this strength from God. Finally, we should notice there in verse 1 that Paul qualified this strength by writing, be strong or become strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul's telling Timothy here that the heavenly strength that he needed is found in the grace of God. It's not found in the gym. It's not found riding your bike. It's not found hitting the bags. It is found in the grace of Jesus Christ. And with this, we must ask, what does it mean to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Well, in order to answer this question, hold your place there in 2 Timothy. I'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And as you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I should remind you that the grace of God, it not only provides us with the gift of forgiveness so that sinners can be saved from the wrath of God, but God's grace, it also includes the benefits that equip the believer with spiritual gifts, and it provides us with the favor by which we're strengthened and enabled to serve the Lord. And so the person who has received the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ has also entered by faith into a spiritual condition which allows us to be governed by the power of divine grace and then empowered to overcome every hardship and deal with every difficulty as we serve the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you would, let's begin reading there at verse 7 where Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here in these verses we find Paul. He's sharing a personal struggle that he was dealing with on a daily basis. And while he doesn't tell us the exact nature of this problem, we do know that Paul was suffering from some physical infirmity that was obviously leaving him physically weak. After praying three times for healing, the Lord just told him, rest in my grace. I'm not going to heal you, just rest in my grace. And from this, Paul learned that it was in his weakness that the Lord's strength could be revealed. It was in his weakness that the Lord was going to be strong through him. And so we must understand that the Lord's strength is perfect perfectly revealed against the backdrop of human weakness. 
from this, we must understand that the strength we need to live for the Lord isn't based on brute force. It's not based on any physical ability, but instead the strength that we need, it's found in the grace of Jesus Christ. And it's for this reason that Paul told Timothy, be strong. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And not only that, but he's also encouraging Timothy, hey, set this example and teach others where to find this strength. He's saying, hey, Timothy, show this to others so that other Christians can also be strong in this grace. With that, let's turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to begin there at verse 2. There in verse 2, Paul declares, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. From this, we see that one of Timothy's responsibilities as the pastor of the church there in Ephesus was to raise up other leaders who understood all of the doctrines that Paul had been teaching him. And the goal here is to raise up future pastors and teachers who would be able to understand the truths of God's word and then teach these truths to future generations. And so he tells them, commit these to faithful men will be able to teach others also. Not only that, but Paul was also encouraging Timothy to teach these future leaders about the source of heavenly strength which is found in God's grace. Because these were the leaders who would be teaching the Christians in years to come about the heavenly strength that comes from the grace of God. And that's my responsibility for you today. To point you to the source of heavenly strength that every Christian has. Now, when it comes to the task of explaining this heavenly strength, I think Paul, you know, Paul, Paul found himself here at a slight disadvantage. And the reason why is based on the question, how do you explain spiritual strength? How do you explain heavenly strength in a way that humans can understand it? How do you take this heavenly strength and, and, and convey the concept to someone in a way that's clear? Fortunately for us, the Holy Spirit led Paul to describe the spiritual strength that comes from God's grace, and and he used three illustrations which we would easily recognize. And he began by helping us to see, number one, that heavenly strength will help us to endure like a soldier. With that, let's consider how Paul puts it here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to begin there at verse 3, because there Paul declares, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Here in these verses, Paul helps us to see that the strength which comes from the grace of God, it's a heavenly strength that will help us to endure like a soldier. It will help to understand that the words endure hardship were actually translated from one Greek word which speaks of the ability to tolerate the tough times and and even weather the storms of suffering and affliction. According to Thayer's lexicon, the original Greek word was also used frequently in reference to the hardships that would be experienced in military service. And listen, if anyone on earth learns how to endure hardships, it's a soldier who's been enlisted in a branch of the military. You see, an enlisted soldier is constantly being pushed to the limits physically and emotionally. And this training is all designed to prepare them for the battlefield where extraordinary endurance will be an essential part of their survival. You see, once a soldier is on the battlefield, they find themselves facing all kinds of hardships that they would have never experienced just in daily life. The soldier on the battlefield will experience the hardships of poor living conditions and substandard food rations. And let's not forget, you know, the whole constant threat of death thing. I mean, that's just a a, a hardship and a difficulty that is right outside their tent every day and every night. And without a doubt, an enlisted soldier, those who are sent out to the battlefield, they'll learn how to endure those hardships more than the average person. And it's with their example in mind that Paul is helping the, the Christians, even us, to understand that we too need extraordinary endurance because the fact is the Christian wakes up on the spiritual battlefield every day. Now, in order to further consider the spiritual war that we find ourselves in, uh, continue to hold your place there in 2 Timothy 2 and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. As you're turning to 1 Peter 5, I think that it's important to point out that before we were born again, we were the enemies of God. 
before we trusted in Jesus Christ, we were God's enemies. And there are those who will say, oh, we're all the children of God. But according to the Bible, no, we were the enemies of God before we trusted in Christ. But then on the day that we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we joined the Lord's army. And as a result, we became the enemies of the devil. It's for this reason that I say that Christians wake up every day on a spiritual battlefield. And this is exactly what Peter's talking about here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Check out verse 8 there where Peter declares, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Here in these verses, Peter's helping us to understand that the devil is seeking to destroy us. And and as long as we're unbelievers, you know, the devil's just like, hey, I got this one. No worries. But the minute we sign up and join the Lord's army, the enemy says, that's my target. And he uses his demonic archers who shoot out those fiery arrows straight into our minds so that we might be consumed with lies and false doctrines and and false ideas. Not only that, but he also sends out human spies who are either knowingly or unknowingly under his influence. And it's through these relationships that he attempts to capture us and to take us out of commission. And so you better believe a a, a, a new believer is going to experience you know, people interested in him that weren't interested in him before. And, and Christians, we're going to find ourselves being invited into relationships that are very tempting, but they're going to take us down the wrong path. And the enemy is planting those spies in our lives to take us out of commission so that we can no longer be a good soldier in the Lord's army. Knowing that the devil is constantly trying to destroy us, Paul tells us, resist him steadfast in the faith continue to walk in the faith that you've placed in jesus christ and resist the devil and there in verse 10 he helps us to see peter's telling us here that it's the grace of god which will perfect us and not only perfect us but establish us and then he says this that this grace will strengthen us and settle us so that we can win this spiritual war now from this we see that both peter and and Paul, they're teaching that God's grace is our true source of heavenly strength. Therefore, the spiritual strength of God's grace, it's designed to help us to endure every hardship. And the example that he gives us is like a good soldier. Well, a good soldier who's not entangled in the affairs of this world. Now, in order to explain what I mean by that qualifier, let's look again there at verse 4. Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to look there at verse 4. Because there in verse 4, Paul explained, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. From this, I should point out that the word entangle there, it's been translated from a Greek word which refers to the process of interlacing something together like a braid or like a weave. Therefore, it's important to understand that God will give us the heavenly strength to endure every hardship like a soldier so long as we keep ourselves free of worldly entanglements. In other words, the Christian who wants to walk in the strength of God's grace must stop being so preoccupied with civilian affairs. Now, in order to further consider this untangled life, hold your place there in 2 Timothy 2, and let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, as you're turning to 1 Timothy 6, we should take a moment to consider just a few of the soldiers who ended up entangled in civilian affairs. For example, consider the news reports of the three soldiers from Fort Carson, Colorado, who were arrested and charged with second-degree burglary after breaking into Rocky Road Remedies in search of medicinal marijuana. Happened last November when Private First Class Ramon Hollins, Private Corey Young, and Private First Class Darius Thomas, they decided to break into the store, and they busted through the back door. Uh, Unfortunately for them, they busted the back door so badly that they couldn't get it back open when the cops showed up and they couldn't escape. As a result, the three soldiers were 
handcuffed, placed under arrest, and prosecuted simply because they desired to get high rather than to be true to their commitment to this country. How about the story of Private Collie Robinson and Private Christopher Jackson? These, these were men who were arrested in Fayetteville, North Carolina in January of 2009. They were charged with two counts of robbery with a deadly weapon and felony conspiracy because they had robbed the RBC Bank there in North Carolina. You see, they desired money over their commitment to their country. Now, in both of these cases, these soldiers, they ended up in a great deal of trouble simply because they failed to keep themselves from getting entangled in civilian affairs. And listen, it, it all started with the wrong desire. They had the wrong desire, and it, was, and, and it went unchecked. And, and then that desire it grew into a passion, and that passion resulted in an action that ended them up in deep trouble. With this in mind, Paul encouraged us to be careful to guard the desires of our hearts here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to begin there at verse 9 where Paul warns us by writing, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Here in these verses, Paul encouraged us to fight the good fight of faith, which it's a fight that begins with the inner struggle against our own sinful nature. And it's a war against our own sinful flesh that we must win. And certainly there's an enemy out there who's firing those, those fiery darts into our minds and trying to get us to think the wrong thoughts. But you know what? It just only plays into what our own sinful nature already desires. And so we have to fight against that sinful nature that dwells within us. We have to fight that good fight of faith. You see, if we let our sinful desires go unchecked, then we'll end up entangled in the sinful affairs of worldliness. We'll find ourselves braided together, weaved in with worldliness. And at that point in time, the heavenly strength of God, what can it do for us when we've decided to braid ourselves and weave ourselves and entangle ourselves in civilian affairs? Therefore, we must tap into the heavenly strength that comes from God's grace so that we can fight this fight. We must remove ourselves from all of this worldliness. We must turn our backs on all of these ungodly desires. And then, by the grace of God, we'll be given the heavenly strength so that we can endure like a good soldier. From this, we see then that the Christian who finds heavenly strength in the grace of God is able to endure every hardship like a soldier. But not only that, According to Paul, heavenly strength will also help us to obey like an athlete. With that, let's turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I, I want to consider how Paul puts it. Let's look there at verse 5, because there Paul declares, And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, as we consider this illustration of heavenly strength, we should consider the rigorous routine of the professional athlete because the athlete who competes on a professional level must not only be disciplined to stay in shape, but they must also be dedicated to winning so that their whole life ends up centered around their sport. They have to be so entirely dedicated to their sport that, that this is their entire life. And then after spending all the hours training and all the months preparing, and the athlete then must compete. But they must compete according to the rules of the game or else they'll be, well, they'll, they'll lose. And it's sad to say that, that so many athletes end up suspended from their sport simply because they didn't follow the rules. For example, it was during the 2010 season of the NFL that the players, there were 25 of them who ended up suspended simply because they broke the rules. Among them, Ben Roethlisberger of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was suspended for four games due to conduct which was determined to be detrimental to the league. Johnny Jolly of the Green Bay Packers was suspended for an entire season after he was busted for breaking the NFL's substance abuse policy. 
closer to home, Dwayne Brown and Brian Cushing of the Houston Texans were suspended for four games after testing positive for performance-enhancing drugs. Now, as we consider the suspension of these players, we must understand that these guys, they, they made it. They were in the league. They had been drafted onto a team. That's something that, that just millions of people dream about. But because of their hard work, because of their dedication, because they had committed themselves to their sport, they made it. And they were in the NFL. And they were playing the game. Unfortunately, their physical strength wasn't enough to keep them in the game. Just because they could play the game, just because they had the, the physical strength to actually go out there and compete on that level, didn't mean that they could stay on that level. You see, their physical strength couldn't empower them to obey the rules of the league. And in the end, their lifetime of training, well, it was unable to keep them from a temporary suspension. From this, I want to consider how, how this applies to the life of the Christian. And so if you would, hold your place there in 2 Timothy 2 and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to point out that a Christian can also be suspended, or in other words, disqualified from serving the Lord. And while this suspended status, it's not a loss of salvation. I certainly don't want to suggest that. But it certainly is a loss of rewards as the bench believer sits on the sidelines and watches God accomplish his plans and purposes through another believer. This is probably what Paul had in mind here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you would, let's begin reading there at verse 24 where Paul asks, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Here in these verses, we find a man, he's, he's, he, it's the writings of a man who was concerned about being disqualified. And the chances are, Paul had watched many Christians serve the Lord for a season or even several seasons only to end up disqualified and suspended from the ministry after failing to live according to God's word. After watching so many of his co-laborers benched for bad behavior, Paul became a Christian who was determined to finish his race like an athlete who's playing to win. He wasn't saying, I, I'll follow some of the rules and hopefully squeak by. He's saying, no, I'm going to bring my body into subjection. And I'm going to play to win. I'm going to serve God in a way that I'm going for the gold. And from Paul's example, it's my prayer that we'll all become believers who are running this race with obedience. In order to do so, we're going to need the heavenly strength that comes from the grace of God, because obedience, it's not part of our natural nature. As a matter of fact, the, the very minute someone tells us what we ought to do, our sinful nature rears up, and we want to do exactly opposite, because we're disobedient people. Therefore, we need heavenly strength to compete according to the rules. With this in mind, if you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, where John points us to this source of strength. And as you're turning to 1 John 2, I want to stress the fact that the Christian doesn't walk in obedience to get saved. But instead, those who receive the free gift of salvation should be so filled with gratitude that now we simply desire to walk in obedience. And let me just say that again. The, the Christian does not walk in obedience to get saved. But because we have received the free gift of salvation, we're so filled with gratitude that we desire to walk in obedience with the Lord. Think about it like this. It was last November when a sudden thunderstorm blew through St. George, Utah, and the public schools, they had just let out as this storm was rolling through. As a result, there were several students who were outside in the middle of this electrical storm waiting for their ride home. That included 16-year-old Dane Zunick. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning struck Dane in the head, which caused his heart to stop beating, and then he stopped breathing. According to Dr. Mike Trimia, Dane was clinically dead. 
Fortunately for him, Dane was rescued by the quick response of a teacher named Ron Hansen, who immediately began to perform CPR. And then after finally re regaining consciousness, Dane looked at his teacher and he uttered those obvious words of gratitude. He said, I owe you my life. He was so filled with gratitude for what this teacher had done for him that he's saying, hey, my life is yours. It's in similar fashion, but yet in a spiritual way that we too were dead in our sins and trespasses. We too were just dead. And by the grace of God, Jesus Christ came along and saved us. He died on the cross for our sins. He sent the Holy Spirit to draw us into this relationship. And when we receive that free gift of grace... heart is filled with gratitude if we truly grasp what, what the Lord has done for us if we truly understand that the Lord has saved us from eternal punishment then like David Zunick shouldn't our hearts be filled with this same sort of gratitude that we just turn to Jesus and say my life is yours I'm entirely yours check out how Paul puts it here in 1 John chapter 2 I want to begin there at verse 1 where he said, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Here in these verses, John helps us to see that those who have received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ should also be filled with the desire and, and with that heart that's filled with gratitude that causes us to just want to keep the commandments of the Lord. And those commandments that he's talking about, well, it's the commandment to love our God with everything in us. And then the second one is like it, which is to love our neighbor as ourself. In other words, those who have truly received the grace of God should also desire to abide with our Savior and live according to his holy word so that we can receive the grace that we need to walk just as he walked. And here's the really good news, because not only does the word of God present us with the rules or the commandments by which we should run our race, but the word also supplies us with the heavenly power that we need to live accordingly. And it's for this reason that John encouraged us to abide in the word so that we can walk as our Savior walked. Then rather than being disqualified, rather than finding ourselves benched believers, unable to serve the Lord, the Christian who seeks heavenly strength through the word of God, we're empowered then by the grace of God to obey the commandments of God. And then, when we stand in the presence of our King, we'll receive our heavenly crown and our everlasting reward. And so we see then that the Christian who finds heavenly strength in the grace of God will be able to endure every hardship, just like a good soldier. Not only that, but the heavenly strength of God will also help us to obey, just like a worthy athlete. But finally, we should consider how Heavenly strength will also help us to work hard like a farmer. And with that, let's turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, where we find this third illustration. I want to begin there at verse 6, where Paul reminds Timothy that the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Well, here in this third point, Paul illustrates the spiritual strength that comes from the grace of God by pointing to the hard-working farmer. And, and actually, Paul is pointing to a farmer who, who is obeying, or enjoying, I should say, he's enjoying the fruits of his labor, right? So, so he's not actually pointing necessarily to the work itself, but, but the, the end result. He's saying, hey, that hard-working farmer, he's going to be the first one to partake of those crops. But without a doubt, the end result took a lot of work. You don't just go walk out into the middle of a field. And, and say, oh, there's, there's my crop. Now, there's a lot of work before it gets to that point, unless you're in someone else's field. Chances are most of us have grown up going to the grocery store where we purchase food that was already planted, picked, and then processed in some factory, which enables us to just pop it in the microwave and eat it within a minute. 
but it's the hardworking working farmer who was there doing all of those laborious tasks like tilling the soil and planting the seed and picking the crops. And it's for this reason that it's the hardworking farmer who is the first one to partake of the crops. Now, the same concept is conveyed in that saying, the early bird catches the worm. In other words, of all the birds on the wire, the ones who fly down early in the morning before the sun even comes up, they're the ones who are enjoying all those delicious, juicy worms. The rest of those birds sleeping on the wire until the sun comes up, when they finally fly down, all they're going to have left is something else. No more worms left. In similar fashion, the, the farmer who's doing all of the work out in the field, the farmer who's working hard, they, they know that they're going to, at the end of the season, when it's harvest time, they, they know that they're going to be able to enjoy the, the ripest, the, the most delicious fruit, and the most delicious crop. They're going to be able to pick the crops at the peak of perfection, enjoy that food right there on the spot. And so the farmer, he... he makes it through the hard work. He endures and he continues to do all that hard work because he knows after the harvest the, the benefits of all that hard work. The farmer sets his sight on the end result and with this goal in mind, the hardworking farmer continues working until the harvest is done. From this example, we should consider how the grace of God will also strengthen the Christian so that we can keep working hard until we find ourselves in the presence of the Lord. With that, if you would, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. And as you're turning to Galatians 6, I want to define the principle of sowing and reaping. And what this means is that a seed is planted, and, and the seed that's planted will produce a crop of the same kind. For example, if you sow jalapeno seeds, then you're going to reap jalapenos. And if you sow apple seeds, then you're going to reap apples. It's pretty logical. I'm sure we all get this principle as it applies to agriculture, and yet how many of us fail to see how this principle of sowing and reaping applies to our own lives on a spiritual basis? If you would please allow me to explain here, because based on this principle of sowing and reaping, we need to understand that, that we're all planting seeds into the soil of our lives every day, whether we know it or not. The only question is this, what seeds are we sowing? Because listen, if we're sowing seeds of pornography into the soil of our lives today, then we can expect to reap a broken marriage and broken-hearted kids. If we're sowing the seeds of anger and greed into the soil of our lives today, then we should expect to bear the fruits of hatred and idolatry, which will manifest at work, at home, wherever. Conversely, if we're sowing the good seed of God's word into the soil of our lives today, then we can expect to be filled with the grace of God, which will then produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, resulting in God's gracious rewards, which we'll enjoy forevermore. With this in mind, check out Galatians 6. I want to begin there at verse 7, because there Paul declares, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap, we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Here in these verses, Paul was alluding to the day when the Christian who was saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ would reap their heavenly rewards as they stand before the bema seed of Jesus. And knowing that the fruits of our labor will eventually result in gracious rewards from God, then my encouragement is let's put our hand to the plow. Let, let's continue to work hard every day, sowing the good seed into the soil of our life. Let's sow to the Spirit according to the strength of God's grace. And there are going to be those days when we start growing weary. There's going to be those times when we're just like, man, I'm so tired of these Christian disciplines, and why can't I just go back to you know, the lazy life of the, the sinner? Yeah, that, that's going to be a temptation. 
we're going to find ourselves struggling to move one step forward in this walk with the Lord. And it's at that point in time that we have to think about the farmer. It's at that point in time that we have to remember that the seeds that we sow into our lives today will bring forth fruit. And I've had too many people sit down with me and say, here's all the fruit in my life, and it's rotten, and what can I do about it? And the answer is, deal with the fruit now and start planting the right seeds today. Don't plant rotten seeds and then be disappointed when you get rotten fruit. You planted the seeds. If you want to enjoy the good fruit, then plant the right seeds in your life today. Whenever you grow weary in doing well, just remind yourself. There's a harvest coming. There's a day coming when we will stand before the Lord and he will give us the rewards that we don't even deserve because those rewards are his grace as well. And it's with that grace that we can be strengthened and realize that God is going to be so so much more gracious when we get to heaven. We get the grace of salvation today. We get the grace of his spiritual gifts so that we can serve him. He strengthens us with that spiritual grace. And then when we get to heaven and stand before him, he rewards us with his grace for all the works that we did or that he did through us. And so with that, we can be strengthened. And we can say, I can take the next step. I can go one more step in my walk with the Lord because we will eventually enjoy the fruits of our labor, some in this lifetime, definitely more in the lifetime to come. So from this we see then that the Christian who finds heavenly strength in the grace of God will be the Christians who are able to endure every hardship just like a good soldier. Not only that, but the Christian who receives the heavenly strength that comes from God's grace will also be able to obey the rules like a worthy athlete. And finally, the heavenly strength that comes from God's grace will help the Christian to work hard like a farmer. Therefore, if this morning you feel like giving up, if this morning you're a Christian who feels like you're you're about to give in to sin. You're about to go back to, to a, a way of life that you don't want to go back to and you just don't know if you can take one more step. If that's how you're feeling this morning, that I encourage you, turn to the Lord. Cry out to him. Spend some time in his word and seek his grace because it's his grace that provides us with that strength that we need to walk with him. The Lord not only saves us with his grace, but with the same grace, he makes us heavenly strong. 